since th there's been a lot of discussions around threat hunting here, um, and it's also one of the most exciting and difficult specialties in InfoSec, our next speaker is a true professional at that. So we're going to go hunting in the network with uh, Neil Grifter Weiler, Senior Threat Hunting and Incident Response Specialist at RSA. He has some great examples to share with us from Black Hat and the RSA conference. So Neil, thank you for being here and we can wait to hear uh, all those stories. Hi, um, welcome to Threat Hunting from Platitudes to Practical Application. I am Neil Weiler, better known as Grifter within our community. Um, so who am I? Uh, by day, I'm a full-time threat hunter for RSA. Um, by night, I run all the technical operations for the Black Hat security briefings um, all over the world. And I also am one of the main organizers of DEF CON, uh, the largest hacker convention in the world. Um, I've been doing Black Hat for 16 years and DEF CON for 18, so I'm old. Um, that picture in the middle there is actually me in the knock at Black Hat running the network. Um, whenever they say like, oh, like the BBC's coming in or CNN's gonna stop by, like I put on something weird like a robe and wizard hat or an inflatable dinosaur suit um, because I don't take it very seriously. So um, I'm also on the CFP review boards for both Black Hat and DEF CON and the training review board for Black Hat as well. I'm the founder of DC801 and uh, the co-founder of 801 Labs, our hacker space in Salt Lake City. So I have no boundaries whatsoever when it comes to work and my personal life. I just do security all the time. All right, so we're going to talk, uh, we're going to talk about hunting and I'm just going to get into it because it's a lot of info to get through. Um, so what is it? So beyond just a buzzword that people like to throw out on the floors of conferences like RSA conference and Black Hat, um, a definition that I've often seen used is proactively searching through data in order to detect threats which have evaded traditional security measures. Well, that's a great definition. What it actually is, is just doing IR before you know you're owned. So it's all the same things. You're doing all the same stuff just before someone tells you oh, there's some really terrible stuff coming out of your network. So it's up to you to find those things uh, before you end up on the 10 o'clock news. And is it effective? Hell yes, it's effective. And why do I say that? Um, so prior to doing threat hunting full time, I was a member of the uh, RSA CERC or the EMC RSA CERC, now Dell. Um, I really don't care whose logo is on my check as long as I get one. Um, but um, I did threat hunting within our CERC we are a large organization, a company like EMC or Dell, right? So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of endpoints um, across the world, um, every country, everything. And we get what would be considered, you know, millions and millions of attacks a day if you talk to marketing folks. You know, like if they're like, your network's being attacked this many times, where really it's just every time somebody touches a port, they count that as an attack. Um, the way that we carved up our incidents within the CERC, we're in two tiers. So our tier two cases are spray and pray. That's a new vulnerability comes out or a new exploit is released, something gets added to Metasploit and all the kids just start spraying it all over the internet. So those are our tier two cases. We get a couple dozen of those a day. Um, our tier one cases are when we know the group that is coming after us has come after us before. So this is a targeted attack by someone who's interested in compromising our location. We, we have a relationship with them, as it were. Um, we, we probably see about a half a dozen of those a day. I don't, I don't know, I'm not doing anything, I swear. Um, so, so out of those, again, millions to whatever gets filtered out of it down to, um, down to about a half a dozen ones we care about. And then out of all of those that happen every day, throughout the year, we had last year five declared incidents. And what we consider a declared incident is either one, the attacker has breached the first level of our defenses. They are somewhere within our environment, or this is a coordinated attack by a sophisticated attacker who is actively coming after us. This is a, you know, we, we, our, our CERC, our SOC has 
glass windows that people like to get paraded past. They're like, look at us do security. Um, this is when the shades come down and we start sleeping at the office, right? So that happened five times last year. Four of those times were found through threat hunting. The fifth was found by a third party who said, hey, like one of our partners, we saw something odd come from your network, right? And we looked into it and we were like, that is bad. Thank you. Um, so you'll notice how many were found through just working cases and incidents out of a queue? Zero. So of the, the declared incidents, the ones that really, really mattered, zero were found by just some analyst sitting behind a keyboard, opening up an incident, and making sure our threat intel doesn't suck. Well, that doesn't mean we don't do those things. It's great to have those people there, and I'm sure they like their jobs, but we should be doing some threat hunting is what I'm saying. So why hunt? Again, it's proactive. Aren't you tired of being completely reactive? Aren't you tired of just sitting there and watching the attacks come at you going, uh, uh, uh? It's, it's nice to be able to say, this is where I'm going to look today. This is what I'll be focused on. It's also a lot harder for someone to hide when you're looking for them. It's like playing hide and seek, but never going and finding your brother and just leaving him there. You know, <laughs> He's in a closet somewhere. It's all right. You get to watch TV, watch whatever you want. Um, it's also a lot harder to find someone when they really know their environment. And you will know your environment better than you ever have before. What you'll do as a threat hunter is also create relationships with your IT department. So the people whose jobs you make harder, or they assume you just make their jobs harder, right? Because you're always like, don't do that. No, you shouldn't do it. No, that's wrong. Security, often, you know, we have a rep of, of just being a huge pain in the ass. And we are. Um, but in this case, it's about building bridges, understanding why networks are set up the way they are, why the endpoints were deployed the way they are, what made someone say, this is our golden image, and that's how we're going to move forward within our organization. Um, what that does is it increases value to your organization. It does that, again, because not only do you have relationships, but you're also, your understanding of that network allows you to be incredibly more effective as a security professional. Because you can say, we made, we made these decisions because of X. All right, so where do we start? Logs. So log all the things, all of it. If I stay still, does it still do it? So, all right. Collect logs. It's, now it's off. Um, am I just getting a microphone now? Sorry. It seems you are. Don't touch the blue side. All right. Let me get this thing off. Sorry about that. You're not sorry. All right. Let's see. Whoa. All right. So collect it all. OS event logs, app logs. Um, know who's authenticating in the organization, wh where they're authenticating, and at what level. Like, understand those things. These are, this is basic block and tackle type of stuff, but it's the stuff we get wrong every single day. Um, don't forget the network, though, right? I love the network. The network's my favorite. I could just, I could bathe in packets all day, just let them wash over me. I, I don't know why. I've always loved just getting in, like, Wireshark and being like, oh, yeah, and everybody around you goes, don't even talk to him. He's, he's way in the weeds, and you're like, not really, I'm just you know, reading a PCAT. But uh, it makes people think you're smart. So if you want to look intelligent, just open up a PCAP in Wireshark and just stare at it like this. <laughs> and people will be like, that dude's earning his paycheck today. <laughs> so get your web server logs, proxy logs, and full packet capture. I cannot stress enough the importance of full packet capture. We talk about logs, we talk about all the endpoint stuff we do. Being able to record what is going on in your network and play that back is the same thing as video surveillance for your network. We would never design physical security for a building today where we didn't include video surveillance. So I don't really understand why when we have the capability to record what's happening on the network, we're not taking that opportunity. When you have full packet capture, it means you can 
say, oh, that looks bad. Let me pull that out of the stream, detonate that in a sandbox, see what it actually does. I, I liken it to um, video surveillance because if you look at logs, logs are basically you saying, okay, um, I badged in today and a log is created that says, you know, Grifter came to work today. He arrived at eight o'clock. He came in the south door. Cool, that's great information to have. No idea whether or not it's actually me, just that an event has taken place. But if you can look at the video surveillance, you can say, oh, Yes, that is him. He's wearing, you know, a black shirt, you know, like I do. Um, you know, he danced his way into the building, whatever. You get significantly more visibility into what was taking place upon entry into that um, facility. And so the same thing is true of a network. If we, if we say, okay, um, we have a log that says this window was broken, but I can go in and look at the full packet and say, I know it was broken at this time. They actually climbed through the window. They came out with, you know, uh, my Xbox, that kind of stuff. That kind of visibility is huge. I understand that this is an incredible amount of data, but big data is just part of your life now, so own it, right? All of the years of, uh, you know, expo floors telling you big data, big data, and all that stuff, the buzzwords prior to machine learning, right? Well, it's real and it's part of your responsibility. So just start doing it. It doesn't mean that you have to record everything that happens all the time for months. What, um, what we do at RSA is we record everything for the entire company for 30 days. So we have every packet that traverses our network across the entire world for 30 days. That's a hell of a lot of data. But we know a guy who knows a guy who has some storage. Um, so you know we can do stuff like that. That doesn't mean you have to do that. If you have a week's worth of full packet, if you have three days, should something happen, should the network be breached, you know, something is actually kicking off that matters, even if you never look at it, you can turn to somebody and say, well, we have this data here. So when, you know, the white knights come running up, uh, you know, the IR team you've hired, you've contracted out to actually come take care of things when something goes wrong, you can say, oh, we have full packet, we never look at it, but it's been rolling a week's worth of data for the last two years, so we at least know we've got that. All right. And of course, uh, security, you can't have security without situational awareness. Understand what normal looks like on your host and network. Um, create a baseline of that, and then you're just diffing against it. Now, we don't all have the ability to be in a network that was created yesterday, right? Um, or get to just build one from scratch. So at a certain point, you have to look at your environment and what you've done and say, yeah, we're good. Like, I think we're good. Um, if you're owned at that time, that sucks because that's part of your baseline. <laughs> but um, hopefully you're not one of those companies who's been breached for like seven years. So. Um, Become intimately aware of what the norms are um, so that when an anomaly occurs, it sticks out like a sore thumb. You see that? That's norm from Cheers. I'm adorable. Um, you'll notice I have weird slides. I just Google image search something from the slide and then I put it in the slide rather than like a stock photo of someone pointing. Um, but, and then also leave your preconceived notions at the door. Don't start with an IOC, or I should say you don't have to start with an IOC. You shouldn't. You should think to yourself, if I was the attacker and I was coming at our environment, what would I do? If I was trying to exfiltrate data from this environment, where would it leave from? Know those ingress and egress points so that when you sit down, you say, okay, this is where I think our defenses are the weakest. Let me go see if someone else thinks so too. Um, so IOCs are, security junk food, right? We get tons of uh, feeds that are just hashes and file names and IP addresses and hosts and stuff that are good for about 10 seconds, right? What matters is the behavioral or the things that enable a compromise to take place. So think in those terms. What's going on in the network that enables an attacker to get a stronger foothold within our environment? Let me go see if they're doing that now. All right, and on the host side, again, basic block and tackle. 
Know what processes are running on your system. Process names, past executables, parent processes. These are, this is not, you know, like shocking things that are going on. Like, oh, oh, I learned this amazing thing at Def Camp. Grifter told us to look at our processes. Like, that's ridiculous. But I can't tell you the number of times that I go in and I say, why the hell is that running? Or what is that? And we look into it, and in fact, it is something bad. Or flat out, the parent process is something that has no business spawning whatever it is I'm looking at. Or the process name is, has a typo in it. You know, I mean, things that basic. But look for stuff like process injection, hooking, artifacts in your shim cache. Know what is happening on the host, and again, then just bump against it. Okay, that, why is there something new here? Um, when you're looking at things like persistence, look beyond the registry, look beyond run keys. You know, what scheduled tasks are configured on the system, and are there services that you didn't create? Typos, blank descriptions, things like that. The path to the binary isn't a normal one. These are things that, again, I see it all the time. And it doesn't matter the size of the company. I can go into a mom and pop shop to some of the largest companies in the world, and these things pull results. So look for stuff like that. On the network, I mentioned earlier, know your ingress and egress points. Where does data come into my network? Where does data leave my network? And has that changed? Um, things like direct IP communication. I'll, I'll give an example of this later on. Um, but direct IP is not something that humans do, right? Like, I'm not like, oh, hey, you know, dark matter. Super cool website. You got to check it out. It's 63.224.75. Like, we don't do that, right? So when you see somebody going to a site or hitting a server or something that is a direct IP communication, that's not normal human behavior. Go take a look. Verify whether or not it's good or bad, whitelist it, move on. And because we like words rather than numbers, um, look for things like dynamic DNS. So attackers will use dynamic DNS all the time. Um, what I will often find when I'm looking at dynamic DNS services are not somebody using this incredible API that the dynamic DNS company has set up to make it really easy for people. What I find is somebody communicating to their file server at home or their media server and they're streaming you know, stuff to the office. Um, but it's still a policy violation and you find it, right? So look for things like dynamic DNS. Um, Tor traffic. You using Tor in your work environment? Maybe someone is. If they are and they're not doing something bad, you just made a friend, right? You're like, hey, you're one of us. Like, so if you see something like that, you know, that, again, not normal, pay attention. IRC traffic, same thing. Um, if you see IRC traffic, one of two things are going to happen. You know, one, you know, you're going to see somebody who's, you know, using some ghetto C2, or two, you're going to make a friend because some gray beard Unix admin sitting in a closet somewhere is on IRC, like, what, what? And then, you know, and he hates Slack because everybody knows Slack is just a colorful IRC interface. Um, like, people think it's like this groundbreaking thing. You're like, you mean IRC chat? You know, like, okay. Um, and then look at your HTTP traffic for things like, you know, anomalies, things like a post with no refer or a post with no get. Again, these are not difficult things. These are looking for things that are happening that the, the protocol doesn't normally do, that a human doesn't do. Um, and, and every time you see one, just marking it down and going, I have to investigate that. Um, and then look for traffic over non-standard ports. Um, I'll show you an example of something we found at Black Hat, um, just looking at things over non-standard ports. It seems ridiculous to do something like that because it's so basic, but what we actually find is, one, bad guys, um, but two, um, it seems like a lot of security vendors use the things that we would normally, you know, use to hide data to do their own hiding of data. So when they're sending callbacks from your machine to their servers, they're doing it over a non-standard port or they're using a DNS tunnel or something. <laughs> and you're like, what, Symantec? Come on, man. Um, all right, 
so the mindset, so the, the mindset of a hunter. I will say too, people are like, oh, who's the right person to hire for my company to be a threat hunter? Is it just somebody that you pick out of the analyst pool or whatever? It's not. What you want is the person who always notices the thing that's slightly wrong or notices the typo in a presentation and says, oh, there's a typo there while you're in the middle of giving your presentation. Or there are two spaces between those two words instead of one. You know that asshole? That's a threat hunter, <laughs> right? So they have a, an ability to see something that's just slightly off and they, and they call it out, you know? It, it just screams at them when they see it on the screen. Um, so when you're actually doing a hunt though, like, know what you're looking for, right? Say, oh, today I'm going to hunt for this. Um, I would recommend MITRE's attack framework if you want to find ideas for things to go look through. Just pull up the attack framework, pick something, and say, all right, I'm going to go look for that. Try to, um, try to match that to what your industry is. If you're healthcare, you know, go look at the APT groups that focus on healthcare and what their tactics are when they attack one of those environments and then look for that behavior or artifacts of that behavior in your environment. But stay flexible. When you go in and you think like, okay, this is what I'm looking for, but you see something shiny and you're like, what was that? That's great. Do that. Like, it's okay to say, wait, hold on. That was weird. Just open up another tab, make a note. This was weird. When I'm on a hunt, what I will often do is as I think, see things, I open another tab, I open another tab, I open another tab, I open another tab, and then I'm like, all right, I'm not done today till all the tabs are closed, right? So those are each like a thing that I have to look into. So prepare for the pivots. There will be many, and just roll with it. Um, this is where having ADHD is gonna pay off, right? Now you can't focus on one thing ever, great, go. Um, so Jason says I didn't put periods on some of them, but one of them has it, and what, see, that, that asshole. Um, so, <laughs> I love you. Um, find tools that help you make sense of the data that you've collected. I don't care, I, like, I work for a vendor, I don't care if you buy a tool from a vendor. Use something open source if you have the bandwidth to do that. But find tools to help you make sense of that ridiculous amount of data because you're going to need the help. It is a lot of data. And so finding the right way to carve through it um, is incredibly important. If you were here for, um, for Dark Matter's Wi-Fi Cactus um, talk, you know, he talked a lot about making sense of the data once it was collected. It doesn't matter if you have all that data if you do nothing with it. So whether it's open source or something you buy from somebody on an expo hall floor, figure it out, but, um, but get something to help. And then document everything that you're doing and what you've learned, and then share it. Share everything you learn. Um, this should go beyond just threat hunting, but honestly, like threat hunting world is the wild west right now. Everybody's got a different way of doing it or whatever. Great, but you might see something and so you go, Oh, well, that, that's a cool way of doing this, but I'm sure other people know that. They don't know it. Stop assuming that the thing you know is already known by others. Write a blog post. Write a tweet if you're so inclined. Whatever it is, get the data out there. Say, oh, this is a cool way. I figured out how to do this. Just put it out there. Um, we need all the help we can get. All right, so what now? So on an actual hunt, what you need when you go in. When I go into environments, um, I will, the first thing I'll ask for is just the network architecture. Give me the diagrams, give me all your cider blocks, give me everything you've got, because I need to figure out the lay of the land. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to do anything here. So you need to understand the way that the environment is laid out. Um, Start identifying potential targets. So tie IP addresses to what the asset is on the other side, and then assign what the business criticality is to those things. If you are not a full-time threat hunter, but you want to do hunting, and there, somebody up the chain says, okay, we'll give you four hours a week to do hunting, you need to understand where the areas are that are the most important to put that effort. 
So if you've only got those hours, where, where is your time best spent? Um, focus on directionality. This shouldn't be a difficult thing to understand. Essentially, when you go in, you sit down and you say, today I'm going to look at only the traffic that's leaving our environment. Because that changes what it is that you're looking for. Or, I want to look at everything that's coming in. Or, you know what? Today's a lateral movement day. And when you're doing lateral movement, I find the endpoint stuff, like if you're looking at your endpoint agents, I get more out of endpoint data when I'm lateral than I do out of network data, because network is so ridiculously noisy and ridiculous. There's so much crap flying across the network laterally. Um, and then determine a time frame. What I'll do, despite whether I have three days, seven days, 14 days, or a month's worth of, of data to look through, I focus on a 24-hour time period. Why? Because it makes it digestible. I can actually do something within that window. And hopefully, if the company's owned, the attacker will have shown their hand at some point, or you know, the C2 traffic has gone out at some point within that 24-hour time period, then when I find somebody doing something they shouldn't or something looks odd and I'm like, this user or this IP address is doing something anomalous, I will focus on that person and then expand the time frame. So now I'm like, show me everything that user did for the last week. And so at that point, you know, you're, you're beyond your one day, but you're hyper focused on an individual um, event or an individual. Um, then just start looking at protocols. This is all service analysis. So start with the smallest number of sessions is what I'll say. So the smallest number of things that show up. So if you just see a bunch of you know, outbound RDP, then you're like, all right, well, let me see what that is. And you can do a quick kill on those because there shouldn't be too many. And then you see you know, VNC or IRC or these, the least used protocols within that environment, just check them off. Because two reasons, one, um, it feels good to finish something uh, when you're looking at that much data. And two, when you're going back to management and saying, this is why, this is how I spent the last six hours, um, whether you find something or not, you can say, I carved through this many protocols on our outbound traffic. When we do our hunting tomorrow, we'll be carving through the same protocols, but we're going to be doing it inbound instead. Um, Document it as you're doing it so you can hand it to the next analyst when they start their hunting hours and you can say, I've already covered outbound this, this, and this, so you can roll from there. And then drill down on those services. So you have things like indicators. Again, indicators compromise are, it's not really hunting, you're just searching, right? So you're like, oh, this is a thing that I know will give me you know, a high fidelity, yes, that's, that's this thing, this is bad. Um, but look for stuff on each one of those service types for behaviors of compromise or enablers of compromise. This is where the protocol is acting as it should. It's functioning in the way it was designed to, but somebody is using the way it was designed in a way that they shouldn't be. So this is not a break, this is not an exploit, this is not anything, this is living off the land, using the tools that are already installed or using the protocols that are actively used in the environment in a way that you know they shouldn't be using them. Um, and then rinse and repeat. Just over and over again. So roll through all your protocols. And then the way that we do it, at least uh, the other hunters and I at RSA, we do an investigate, investigate, eliminate. And what I mean by that is if I see something that means enough to me that I'm going to dig into it, well then I decide, yeah, this is nothing. Unless I can say with 100% certainty that, oh, okay, yes, that is in fact good, I will turn to the person next to me and I'll say, I thought this was weird because of this. Will you just look at it really quick? They look at it, they say, yeah, that looks clean, and then we get rid of it. Um, so find the signal in the noise. It's a lot of noise. So focus on the things that actually matter. And when you start seeing those false positives come in, whitelist those out. So that each day as you're doing that, you get more and more actionable data as your hunts go on. Um, and then build reports or write scripts or do whatever you need to to automate some of the pain away. If you know that your first, second, and third carve on these protocols give you this, this, and this data, and that's something that's interesting to you every day, don't do that every day. 
write something to do that every day and deliver you an email that says, these were the odd domains for the last 24 hours. Um, so this is something that uh, myself and another guy at RSA, Matt Tharp, created. We call it the labyrinth. Um, it's the map of the labyrinth. Also, we just really like David Bowie. Um, but for me to go through this would probably take about two hours, so we don't have time to do that. But essentially, this is our map for a network hunt. When we go in and say, okay, we're going to carve up a protocol, here are the things, or at least the base things that we want to get done. And so you see things in there like, you know, when you're looking at stuff like SSL or TLS and people say, oh, well, it's encrypted, so you get nothing out of that. False. You know, you can find out what the versions are, the protocols that are being used and their ciphers, whether or not self-signed certificates are being used, the interval or the session size. So you look at SSH and you see that the session size is small and you know that that looks like it's just somebody sending commands back and forth. Or if it's very large, those are file transfers. Somebody's moving data. So you can still gain visibility into things that you can't see based off of metadata, essentially. Um, if you want to talk about this, we can talk about it later or tomorrow, whatever. All right. So what do we find? So this is where I get to do a little bit of show and tell from things that we have found at either Black Hat or the RSA conference. So I also, um, because I work for RSA, when the RSA conference rolls around, now I get to do hunting within all of the um, traffic at RSA conference as well. It went down kind of like this. Um, I had been doing stuff for the knock at Black Hat forever. Um, at a certain point, I said, oh, I'd really like to use um, NetWitness, RSA's NetWitness in the environment. We brought them in and started using them. Uh, they ended up hiring me, good for me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we started using their stuff. The folks from RSA conference were like, man, that was really cool what you guys did at Black Hat. You know, like, we should do that at, um, at RSA conference. And I'm like, yeah, you should do that. And they were like, yeah, you should do that. <laughs> and I was like, damn it. Um, the differences are this. At Black Hat, I control the entire network infrastructure. So we remove everything, every router, every switch, all of it. The only thing we use at the Mandalay Bay at, at the US show is the wires in the wall. We trust nothing there. Also, it's kind of garbage for being a giant casino that has billions of dollars. You would think they'd have more than 10, 100 switches, but they don't. Um, so we remove it all. It also allows us to do mitigation. So if something, we see something bad, we can take steps to fix that or, you know, actually stop an attack versus at RSA conference where the Moscone Center, where RSA conference is held, they just give us a tap. Um, we can see all the traffic. We can see if something's bad. If it is bad and there's an attack going on, we go, look at it go. <laughs> there's nothing we can do about it. No mitigation whatsoever. So a little bit different. So what is this? So this is the amount of traffic at Black Hat USA this year for 2018. And this is just email. So what email is encrypted and unencrypted? So you can see there, one in three emails. And this holds true for the last several years, um, including RSA conference, one in three emails that go across the public Wi-Fi network at Black Hat or RSA conference, two conferences entirely made up of people from the security industry, regardless of whether they're analysts or programmers or they work in marketing or sales, these people work in security. One in three of their emails are unencrypted. These are tens of thousands of emails. It's actually, I think it was 1,500 unique accounts, email accounts at Black Hat USA alone this year. So, I have the thing on there that says beware the supply chain. And the reason is, is that we saw emails coming across that appeared to have been sent securely by someone, but then were forwarded by someone else who did not have their email secure. So it doesn't matter, even if you're trying, if everyone's not trying, right? Because they just forward it on and there it goes. And so, um, what, we, what we're seeing is, you know, someone says, I passed the information the client has sent us regarding the unidentified users that have accessed this server. It is this. And then obviously we've redacted it. 
But so this is sensitive information being sent across the wire. We also see stuff like this. So attached below is a link to the recording from yesterday's call for those of you who may have missed it. And then a tokenized Dropbox link. So now I can listen to your call too. I don't know what you talked about, but I can know, right? So again, this, you think, oh, well, we're, all of our calls are recorded and kept in the cloud. The cloud's secure, right? Yay, cloud, it fixes everything. Well, when you're sending a tokenized Dropbox link across um, in the clear and anybody can go listen to that call, it doesn't really matter, does it? Um, you'll also see uh, down here another email that says, attach are both my timesheet and so-and-so's from last week. Please let me know if you have any questions. So somebody's timesheet, you know, from work. We've also, we've also seen things like financial reports. So company earnings and things like that. We actually, at RSA conference this year, because we knew the names of the individuals who were involved and the company that was sending it, we could go down to the expo floor to this security vendor and say, hey, your CEO just sent the CFO all of your financial earnings for the last quarter in the clear over the wireless network. Has this been made public or do we need to, you know, like call the SEC or whatever, you know, like it was, it was bad. Um, in the end, they had already disclosed the data so it wasn't as bad as it could have been, but still, it's bad. All right, so strong passwords. What you see here, um, blurry, and if you're in the back, you can probably make out a little bit more than the people who are closer. But are all the passwords that, and not all, because there were thousands and thousands of them, the passwords being sent across the network at Black Hat in the clear. So if you're looking at it, you can tell there's some really long ones in there. And some people, it was like, they did, they did a solid job, right? Alphanumeric, uppercase, lowercase. They had special characters, super long but they sent it in the clear, so it doesn't matter, right? Good try, though. Just, just that close. You were that close. Um, so it doesn't matter how complex your password is if you keep firing it across the network in the clear. Um, in this case, uh, people sending SOAP calls to, uh, you know, back to their API, API calls with their passwords in the clear on it or um, encoded with that super, super secure Base 64, right? Um, so we see a lot of stuff like this as well. In this case here, what we have is individuals logging in with their phones to their IoT camera back at home, or their doorbell, or the camera that points at their backyard, or in their living room. And they think because some manufacturers created this thing that they've done the work, right? They put in the work, this is gonna be secure. They, have, it's on the app store. I downloaded their app from the Play Store. Somebody vets that for security, right? No, All right? So um, in this particular case, what we saw was folks who were, uh, the authentication piece was actually encrypted but once the stream itself, once the video stream began, all of that was in the clear. So I can see your dog. Look at him there, hiding under the recliner. I can see you, you're a good boy. Um, so yeah, I can see your living room. Don't just trust an app because you downloaded it from the Play Store or the App Store. Fire up Wireshark, connect to your Wi-Fi, start messing around and see if you can see what it's actually doing. All right. In this case, you know, whenever Black Hat or RSA conference is coming around, you'll often see a, articles come out that say like, oh, here's the top 10 things you can do to make yourself safer on the most dangerous networks in the world at Black Hat and DEF CON. Um, and then there's inevitably something in there that says, use a VPN. Whoa, groundbreaking. Well, this guy got the message, right? I'm gonna use a VPN. However, unfortunately, the VPN he chose sent all of the actual handshake and credentials across the wire in the clear, and then the server responded with, just so I make sure I got that, was this all the data that you meant to send us? And it was like, yes. And then 
the VPN was established and all of the actual stream was encrypted. But again, like that close, that close. Um, so this was something that we found at the RSA conference, um, at the uh, US RSA conference. What what we noticed was that this was, this was not this year, it wasn't 2018, this was 2017, that it happened to fall on Valentine's Day, right? So you got a bunch of lonely hackers looking for love. Just, I need a date tonight, I'm so alone. Um, so we saw a lot of really interesting traffic going across the wire. What we saw as well was a significant amount of Tinder traffic what was interesting about the Tinder traffic was all of the profile images were in the clear. Not only were they in the clear, but based on the, whether they were swiping right or left, changed the response on the wire, and we could tell, that guy likes brunettes. <laughs> so we couldn't tell who it was. It didn't say, you know, like, oh, this is Grifter, and he prefers blondes. Like, it wasn't anything like that. But there was a unique identifier associated with those swipes. Um, so we let uh, Tinder know, and they fixed it in, I want to say it was April or May of this year. So it took them a little while. Um, they didn't think it was that much of a big deal. But they got it fixed, so, so that's good. Um, in this case, when you're, when you're looking at your devices, not all things are created equal. What we had was we saw some information come across the wire that, uh, the wire, that's me, the wire, um, that was of a sensitive nature. It was the schedule of the keynote speaker for RSA conference. His flight and the tail number of the jet, the private jet he was coming in on, um, the limo service, what time they would be there, his schedule for the entire day, the hotel he would be staying at, when he was expected to arrive in different places, all of it was there, right? We knew who the individual was um, because everything was in the clear, so we had their name, we sent them an email <laughs> and said, hey, you should come by the SOC. We need to talk to you. Um, he shows up. One of the analysts says, hey, we think you're sending information out in the clear. Can I see your phone and see if it's configured correctly to send you know, email encrypted? And the guy's like, no way. And he's like, well, here's your password. And we just saw the tail number of so-and-so's jet. And he was like, here's my phone. <laughs> right? I was like, there you go. Take a look. So, um, so everything's fine on the phone. So he's like, wait, are you using any other devices or things to connect to your servers or anything? And he's like, oh yeah, I use my MacBook as well. And he's like, can I see the MacBook? Sure, pulls out of the backpack, looks at it, one radio button, just one button. And all of the emails that had been leaving from the MacBook were in the clear. So make sure, again, that everything is secure. The, the problem here is always that when you think you're secure and you're not, you know, you're actually more dangerous than if you just believe, uh, someone might see this. When you think, I can do whatever I want because I know everything's secure, you're actually more of a liability. All right, patch management. So this is the top 10 sites with uh, the amount of data transferred at the Black Hat security briefings. What you'll see is number one, Windows Update, two Windows Update, three Windows Update, four Kali Linux, we got one, we got one. Five Windows Update, six Apple Updates, seven Windows Update, eight Windows Update, nine Ubuntu, and 10 Office Updates. Seriously guys, just 24 hours sooner and, and you'd have been great. I'm glad you're patching, I'm glad you're patching. Do it at home, right? Don't wait till you get on the Black Hat network to go, oh, that's right, I should patch my machines. Um, in this case, this was one of the ones where we saw direct to IP traffic, where it was just, okay, there's some direct to IP traffic here, what's going on? Um, we noticed that the 404 pages that were being returned when somebody was um, sending out these requests were of a different size every time they came back. Not, you know, something that could, you know, it, would always be malicious, but it was odd. It's out of the, the ordinary, so we took a look at it. What it ended up being was um, someone had uh, released or, or announced a vulnerability 
Um, and this is 12 hours later, an active exploit being used for that vulnerability on the Black Hat network. So we're talking about someone had said it from the stage, and in less than a day, it was actively being used on the network at Black Hat. So not a zero day, right? But same day. So. Um, all right, and in this case, IRC traffic. So we look at IRC traffic just to see what's going on, right? Um, we see there's a private message from a guy, and he says, hey, do you still have that RF pager script? Um, Roto Router has a hack RF now as well. I'm thinking it would be worth trying it out at the Luxor. Um, so we have a good working relationship with the MGM, which is the company that owns Mandalay Bay, as well as several other casinos on the Las Vegas Strip. We meet with them every day, talk about what we saw, things they may have seen. Um, we also, all of the casinos within Las Vegas, all get on a conference call with each other every day while Black Hat, B-Sides, and DEF CON are going on. They become really close friends because they're all in it together, right? So um, in this case, we let those guys know so they could go over to the Luxor and watch for somebody messing around. Um, pro tip. Don't screw around with casino security, right? If there's anyone who's good at security and has been doing security for a really long time, it's a casino, and their security teams, like electronic security, are really good as well. So, you know, there, there has always been cameras everywhere, but when security finds you doing something like this, they take you to the room without cameras, and they work it out, <laughs> right? Don't mess around with casinos. Actually, a little sidebar. How am I on time? Am I good? What? Yeah, all right. Um, little side note there, tangent, was so there was a shooting in Las Vegas last year. A bunch of people killed. Crazy dude, right? So all of Las Vegas goes crazy and says, oh, we need to do all this stuff to make people more secure. One of the things the Mandalay Bay chose to do was um, make it so that you had to use your room key to get up to whatever floor you were staying on. Somehow that was supposed to make people more secure, even though the guy who did the shooting had a room and could have got to his floor if he wanted to. So security theater, yay, right? Here's the thing. The reader in the elevator, um, if you just like bumped it, if you bumped it, um, the cover would come off. And there was a little, um, I don't know, uh, a connector under there. It had some pins sticking out of it. And if you took your thumb and you just swiped it across those pins, it shorted it out. It shorted it open. So it failed open, and now you can go to any floor. Good job, guys. I don't know how much that cost, but it was worth every penny, right? So I take a literally six-second video of me doing this. Boop. And I tweet it out. And a couple minutes later, my phone rings. <laughs> and it's the security team from Mandalay Bay. And they just go, and I'm like, hello, and they're like, grifter! I thought we were friends. <laughs> right? And so a conversation ensued. Um, I went back and forth with them. They wanted me to take the tweet down. I said, well, you know, it's kind of on you guys. You're doing this stuff, blah, blah, blah. I'd like to know that your physical security team is going to do something before I remove it, because they were like, oh, we understand that there was an issue here. And I was like, but you didn't care until just now, right? So they. I, I got to talk to someone else from the security team. They told me that they were going to be doing some stuff with it. And since I hadn't done, you know, like a 90-day disclosure, I was like, all right, I'll take the tweet down. So, But I'm sure it's still a thing. All right. Hey, look, devices on the network. That one looks familiar. So does that guy. So at Black Hat, we deal with all kinds of things. Um, physical devices show up. We have people who come into the space and just do the old chuck in a USB into training rooms. Like literally, I watched the guy like walking down the hall, throwing USBs across the floor into training rooms, just hoping someone will pick it up. And we pick it up. And then we're like, all right, let's dump it and see what they were trying to do. Like what's the attack they were trying to do? Plus free stuff, right? Same thing with this here. Um, what you see on the left-hand side is just a $3 little Wi-Fi chip with a, and I thought they went a little, um, a little crazy with 3D printing the battery holder. Like, I'm like, guys, it's like 12 cents on Amazon, but cool, you know, you do you. Use that 3D printer at the hacker space. 
Um, and so whoever it was had, had created a bunch of D authors and they were throwing them around the black hat floor. Um, this one was found in a planter. And so again, free stuff, you know, so we're happy. But it was funny because we think about the, you know, the guy who did this and he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to bring this device and I'm going to throw it out on the network and I'm going to do whatever. And we're like, that's cute. Cause you bring that and we bring this. And we're like, and so obviously, you know, that's dark matter. And he brought out the Wi-Fi cactus and had it set up on the table. Actually, Lyle, who is our mascot for the knock, is wearing the backpack. Um, and yeah, so when we look at people who come out and, and throw things like that around in the planters and stuff, we're just like, that's not a knife. This is a knife. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thanks. All right, I know I'm, I went five minutes over, so. Absolutely, no worries. Thank you so much for that, for that presentation. Uh, we're going to go to questions now, and we have oh, time for... Oh, questions, sweet. Yes, of course. Okay, let's go. No. Yeah, so when you're threat hunting, yeah. and you need to go to internet browsing, what are your go-to sites? Um, when I, are you asking what sites I go to on the internet? Is that... That's no. very... Yeah, I was like, damn. <laughs> It's got like a real personal, real fast. Um, I guess I should say clarify. How do you mean? Like when we're when we're looking at HDB traffic, like the stuff that they're sending. I mean, because what I'm essentially looking at in a packet capture is just um, I'm not. I don't care about the content. I don't care about what the sites are that they're browsing to, unless I know that's a specifically a malicious site. What I care about is um, you know the number of headers that exist within that request. Like if it's you know, less than six, then that's probably a machine. You know, I should be looking at something more like eight, nine, 10, 11 different headers that exist within it. So I don't necessarily care about the site. Mm -hmm. I care about what's contained in the request or the post or whatever. All right. Cool, next one. Let's save one from the other side as well. Uh, hi, so where about you? hunting. Ah, you hunting. Uh, you mentioned at some point a platform or a website where you can get ideas about what to hunt for today. Uh, I didn't catch it, so if you could just uh, tell us again and why is it a good idea to go there? Sure, so if you're not familiar with the MITRE ATT&CK framework, that's what, that's what it's called, MITRE, so um, M-I-T-R-E, and then ATT&CK, but the A is an ampersand because YOLO, I don't know. Um, but yeah, MITRE ATT&CK is a, a framework that was uh, set up by MITRE uh, in an organization within the United States where it basically uh, shows all of the tools and things that like an attacker would use. It puts a lot of, it's all the stuff you actually care about or should care about. So tactics, techniques, you know, procedures, that kind of things. You wanna look at TTPs. You don't necessarily care about IP addresses and host names. Those are, um, again, those are garbage IOCs. What you care about is this attacker uses these types of tools in this way. They manipulate the traffic this way and you'll find all that in the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Awesome. Next question. We got a couple of well, shiny, here. I'm sweaty. Why is it so hot in here? I am. Okay. So um, regarding your um, threat hunting. Where are you? Yeah, there here. you are. So uh, how much uh, would you reckon that it's uh, manual work and how much can you automate uh, through a process of an IDS system with machine learning and other fancy technology oh, in the man. future? Yeah, uh, the robots will save us all. Um, honestly, the, the manual part is the discovery piece. So when you do things like, you know, you're, you're focused on directionality or something and you do your first carve and then you say, okay, I'm focused on this protocol and then they carve again. And then you start to find the things that you say, okay, this behavior is anomalous. Then you go ahead and write the report or the script or whatever to do that. So those are the things you can automate once you have done the discovery yourself of this type of behavior might matter. Um, and so you don't want to do things that are going to send an alert, you know, like 200 alerts a day because no one's going to look at that. You want to start whittling things down to where it becomes digestible and like, okay, I can, I can definitely look through 40 sessions and say, okay, let me look at that traffic really quick. Yeah, that's all fine, you know. So um, 
So there is a lot of manual part to it, but that's the point, is that despite all of the blinky boxes and everything that vendors try to sell you, um, to Jason's, uh, referencing back to Jason's point, it, it, Dave is the one who's gonna save us, right? Because Dave is the guy who's gonna sit behind a keyboard and do the actual hunting. So where some people say that humans are the weakest link, they're also the best thing to do hunting for because we know like, okay, this, this is not how a human behaves and a machine, at least to date, can't do that. Okay. Regarding log all the things, I was wondering how do you make sure that you don't cross the line between logging some sensitive stuff that might concern privacy or I don't know, I'm thinking about application logs more. So, um, so you're saying like the sensitivity of the information. Honestly, like that is not, it's not something that somebody can decide for any, like it has to be done organization to organization. So your, what's sensitive to you may not be sensitive to someone else, right? So um, what, what I see, like, so I don't decide what gets logged and what doesn't get logged. As a full-time threat hunter, I just get like, hey, you're going to company XYZ this week and I'll be out on an engagement within that company. So I don't have control over what they log. I don't have control over what they've captured packet-wise. I just know when I come in, this is the data that I have. Let me carve through it. Um, so it really, it's up to them. Like I, I have no, like this is the best way to do it. It just depends on the organization. What's, what's super sensitive to you may not matter to somebody else. Two more questions. Um, about uh, full packet capture, you said that it would be okay to capture even one week or three days. But uh, statistics say that uh, threats can be found in more than 100 days. Sure. So you're basing your uh, recommendation so, on just b getting lucky? So what, which is a lot of what, what we do is, let's be honest, okay? Like, I don't, like, we should not bullshit each other that a lot of times we just get lucky. Um, so what you're saying is basically an attacker, once they've reached an environment, will often persist for 100 days plus until they're discovered. That's fine. Um, me having that data lets me go look for the things that they're doing. Um, threat hunting is not about stopping the attacker. It's about finding them before they've um, done something really stupid. People will often say things about like, oh, the red team you know, uh, if, you're, if you're an attacker or whatever, the hackers have it really easy because I, I as the blue team guy just have to make a mistake once, right? And then they're in the environment. Well, that flips on its head the moment that person is in the environment and now the game is my game. So I'm the blue team and if that attacker messes up once, I find them. So. It, it doesn't matter if they've been there for 30 days, 90 days, 100 days, a year. If no one's looking in the environment, then they're never showing their hand. But if you start looking around, now your, your chances have shot up astronomically on actually finding somebody. Last question. Who's up for it? That guy. Hi. When uh, you don't know what is normal in uh, your network, what is the first step uh, in threat hacking? Um, so if you don't know what's normal, I mean, essentially that is what I run into on most engagements, right? Because they're customers, they're not our environment. When I was doing threat hunting specifically for RSA, I could say, okay, this is normal for environment or we don't configure things that way. But the, the first step is to just start documenting it. Like you, if you don't know what normal is, you have to figure out what that is. So you, if it, even if that means starting from scratch and being like, okay, how is this network set up? And everybody just like kind of nervously looks at each other and they're like, I have no idea. Did anybody write this down? Like start writing it down. Um, document, documentation is huge. Again, um, calling back to Jason's talk, like metrics matter, right? So unless you document the things that matter, um, you have nowhere you know, nowhere to go. And even if there is no documentation, then, well, then great, it can only get better, right? You're at the worst possible place you can be, um, and it's just gonna get better from there. And you're gonna look like a hero, because you're like, look at all the things that I've documented for you all. I'm amazing. I created a wiki, um, so. Cool, well, thanks again.
Thank you.